Exactly. But reference was made to the caning of Charles Sumner. That's true. And he was caned by Preston Brooks of South Carolina, who went through his collection of walking sticks and canes <coughs> and uh, uh, various. And he pulled out something that was flexible. It was made out of gutta percha, South American material, hollow at the core. And it's, it's hard, but it's brittle. And sometimes these canes had, if I can get a, a dagger out, it uh, seems to be stuck. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But anyway, uh, that is an example of the violence that was taking <coughs> place in Congress uh, increasingly in the late antebellum era in the 1850s. mainstay of New England textile industry, you know, 800, 900 pound bales of cotton that are being shipped up here uh, by railroad, uh, by, tr by merchant ships, and the spindles from textile mills. Uh, you can get these at the museum in Lowell. In fact, one of uh, our governors just before John Albion Andrew, uh, perhaps the greatest of all the war governors, John Andrew, a staunch Republican, a lawyer, who helped defend John Brown, but his predecessor was Nathaniel Banks, known as the Bobbin Boy of Waltham. <laughs> if you go to the town common or the city common in, in uh, Waltham, you can see uh, the statue of uh, General Banks because he began his life in a textile mill, <coughs> pulling these off when they were full of thread and throwing them in a basket in the hopper and inserting a new spindle on the, on the machine. My question to begin our second session, and James McPherson and a number of other historians have wrestled with the subject in the past 15 or 20 years, is the question of motivation. Why did these men fight? You know, why did they join up? Why did they fight, uh, many of them, bravely and ferociously until they're killed or wounded, uh, until the term of service is over, until the war is over? Why, why do these men fight? Martha? I think that goes back to what they were doing before the war actually started. I know, for instance, that in the mills, I mean, think of, I, that was one of my first jobs here 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, people would work in a place like this, hot in summer, cold winter. But what was the alternative? Farming. Farming is hard, hard work. And these, these guys, you know, we, all of a sudden the bandwagon comes through. There's a pretty girl sitting there, uh, there's plenty of beer, there's something to eat. You know, join up. They're in the service and they, they um, a lot of them couldn't, they couldn't read. They, they probably didn't know how to march. They, they certainly didn't know how to march. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> they didn't know how to march, that's for sure. Oh, well, you know, I, after a while. But uh, this, this was really, other than the farm, the first job that they probably had and they were taught to what to do and not to ask questions. And uh, once they were in there, I think they saw the horror of what went on on the battlefield. What, what else could happen? One soldier described charging the enemy, and he said it was like being in a moving box. You had men in front of you, behind you, on both sides. There were sergeants keeping the file straight. There were <coughs> officers behind you. Maybe an exceptionally brave or perhaps stupid officer would be in front of you, but there was no way out of this moving box. Once the box starts moving, mm -hmm. you really have no choice but to go forward. You're, you're not a man anymore, you're just part of a machine. Somebody else had a, <coughs> yeah, Liv? A lot of, a lot of these uh, soldiers and volunteers uh, came from the same village, and they right. had men on either side of them that were, that were neighbors and friends. And they weren't about to cut out and uh, have somebody carry that story back that this guy was a traitor or a coward. Yeah. Yeah. Showed the white feather. The white feather. And the incentive, uh, that, uh, that incentive continues today in the military. Uh, the thing is, uh, I know from the Marine Corps, you never, you, never leave, you never leave a buddy out there. It's always this buddy system. I mean, and that's why, that's, and I think that's <coughs> why a lot of men go into combat, you know, they know that the, they could get hurt or killed, but they're worried about the, the opinions of other men on, on themselves. And I think that was even that was even more so back then, in that Civil War, the Revolutionary War too. 
Yeah, it's like a bond. It's D Day. You know, they were going to fight with their soldier, like you said, with their buddy. I mean, it was a bond that you formed. That they weren't going to turn around and leave their. The only person they had in the world at that moment was the person next to them, behind them. You know, they're they're going forward until they're told. And like you said, they're a machine. They forget about the humanity. They're going to kill. They're going to pillage, and they're going to do what they're told and follow everyone else, and then deal with consequences later. Mm -hmm. Sure. If you deserted, you were shot or killed if you didn't make it. Mm -hmm. So there's an incentive as well. Yeah. <laughs> Not like now when they throw you in military prison. An incredible <laughs> number deserted uh, on both sides, north and south, but the south could afford the desertion, the hemorrhaging of their course, less than the north could. See? Maybe I misinterpreted the question, but uh, I, my understanding of what you were asking is why would people choose to serve? Like yeah. you said, Lincoln asked for. 75,000 volunteers. <coughs> Why would 75,000 men <coughs> volunteer to serve in the Union Army? Uh, they weren't being drafted, they weren't being transcripted, they were asked to volunteer. And some of it is a history going back to the Revolutionary War, a choice of service to preserve the mm -hmm. lifestyle we've become accustomed to, preserve the freedoms that we have. And even today's military, uh, you, not so much Vietnam because as you said then people were running their draft cards but today's military is an all volunteer force <coughs> and so why would people volunteer there are economic incentives uh, a number of people getting a college paid for by yeah. serving but it still comes down to a choice to serve and why would you do Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think also, at least in the early part of the war, you know, when the war first began, you can't discount the fact that, you know, many of them signing up are very young. This is the first time they're going to be away from home. They're going to get a fancy uniform, presumably, mm -hmm. a weapon. It's the, the whole, you know, 19th century Victorian romantic concept of warfare, you know. And, and even today, I think things haven't changed, at least with respect to, you know, when 19 and 20 year olds go off to war, for the most part, they don't think they're going to die. You know, they, right. they tend to think they're immortal. So I think mm -hmm. in the first one, the rush to the colors, you had a lot of very naive people that really didn't know anything about war going off to fight this thing. And then, of course, when you get into the real slaughter, when you know, we get to you know, uh, uh, Fredericksburg and all that, and the Lisbon's go down, and then shortly after, certainly after Gettysburg, you have to decide drafting people to come in. Um, you know, the, 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 the dynamics change. So I think the question has to be phrased, <coughs> you know, the same question proposed to the first part of the war and into the second half of the war. Because, you know, after, like I said, after Gettysburg, you know, there's a real dynamic changes. In Good point. Mm -hmm. Different motivations yeah. depending yeah. upon the period, the time. Yeah. Didn't, didn't most of the people envision that this thing was going to be over in 90 days anyways? That there wasn't going to be a four-year term or a year term. I was going to go take care of business and I'd be home before you knew it. A lot of people on both sides, many of them not in uniform, many of them would never be in uniform, the chicken hawks of their day. Yeah, they thought this was going to be a 90-day war or less. <coughs> I have a question that you mentioned in the first half that um, the Massachusetts militia was reorganized in 1850, around 1850. And I was wondering what would have been the impetus for Massachusetts to feel as though it was threatened militarily in, in 1850. John Andrew, when he took office uh, uh, January 1st of 1861, uh, he, he immediately <coughs> speeds up this process, but steps were taken even before he took office by people in either elected positions or <coughs> people that had money, people that had political influence, who feared and or believed that war was coming. So they decided to, to strengthen and reinforce and improve the Massachusetts militia because they thought it was going to be needed very soon. Did the abolitionists have a hand in that? No, the abolitionists were still, like Wendell Phillips, uh, insulting the American flag, saying that they couldn't take no pride in being an American, uh, as Garrison was doing, burning the Constitution. Um, some of the abolitionists are talking about seceding from the slaveholding republic. This is immoral, this is wicked, New England should leave, New England should secede, New England should pull out. They talked about it during the War of 1812, near the end, the Hartford Convention. That kind of was a bust after they got the word of Andy Jackson's victory at the Battle of New Orleans. But the abolitionists did not think that 
slavery was going to be destroyed by this war. They did not think that this was a good thing. And most of them are apolitical. They're not involved in politics. They're, they're anti-political. Uh, what, what would have been the motivation for people to want to be in a more uh, well-trained militia in Massachusetts? The average person, I mean, the question is, why, did, why were people willing to fight the war? Well, why, in the first place, why would somebody have been willing 10 years before the war began to start organizing and become involved in a militia? I mean, that somehow that mindset must have been planted just years as, before the war started. Just as white Southerners, and, and especially slaveholders, feared the abolitionists, feared that these, these <coughs> fanatics from the North were going to take their slaves or free their slaves, there, there are people in the North who are very afraid of, of these violent, uh, rapacious, uh, fanatical states' rights, pro-slavery uh, uh, fire eaters. And, and the fear that their way of life up here in New England, as far north as Massachusetts conceivably, might, might be threatened, that it, we might have to defend our way of life. Uh, there was a captain in a Massachusetts regiment <coughs> early in the, in the spring of 1861, Captain Parker, his ancestor, was at Lexington Common on Patriot's Day. And the first shots were fired. And it wasn't uh, wasn't up in New Hampshire. It was right here in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Parker was was he had a company a company of men from uh, 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 Lexington and, and surrounding towns, and there was a West Pointer there, some young pipsqueak, and he was out drilling the troops and cursing them, just blood curdling curses. And some of the men complained to Captain Parker. He's about 58 or something. He's quite elderly. So he confronts this long, young uh, lieutenant, and he says, stop cursing at my men. In the military regulations, it says officers are not to curse men. And the young captain said, well, what do you know? What do you know? And Captain Parker says, sir, I know that if I order my men to leave the drill field, they will obey my orders, and you will have no men to command. <laughs> <laughs> he died in 1864 in the siege of Petersburg. Wow. He was the real deal. His men loved him. He loved them. He led them until he died. You know, Michael, uh, I think part of the answer also may be, it, it is conventional to say, but true, that we are besieged with ways of amusing ourselves. <coughs> this wasn't true in the 1840s and 1850s. And joining marching companies with the snappy drill and the uniforms, mm -hmm. this was a form of fun back in those days. Mm -hmm. And the Southerner, to the Southerners, you know, you read about the Richmond Rays and the uh, Washington uh, uh, artillery and all that. Uh, and uh, what's in the first guy that got killed on the Union side who drilled the Zouaves? Ellsworth. Uh, Ellsworth. Ellsworth, thank you, yeah. Uh, th these guys uh, would go, Ellsworth took his uh, company of drillers around the country, uh, you know, and they would perform and so mm -hmm. forth. You know, and it's also a little known fact. You, you know, the, the South uh, was a very violent place, or so it is said. It was. And uh, the Coguello Raid. Duels, duels, and the South early on got the idea that it was going to have to fight. So they not only had marching companies, military companies, call it what you will, but around the 1840s and 50s, a huge number, apparently a huge number, of military academies sprang up. And uh, having once gone to military military academy and loved it, oh, I wish I had been there. But anyway. Um, that's when you got, for example, I believe the Citadel, isn't it, uh, Michael? I think the Citadel goes back to the Mexican exactly. War. Okay, but there were a lot of military academies <coughs> that sprang up in the South, or so I have read, you know, and that was because they thought they're going to have to mm -hmm. fight someday. Now, one thing that wasn't answered, you might, you might, you might uh, approach, uh, deal with this. People here talk a lot about why the Northerners fought. I guess it's self-evident why the Southerners fought. Well, there have been all kinds of books done on it recently. Um, motivation, combat, why, why men fought on both sides. Um, uh, someone 
referred earlier to Professor McPherson speaking at the law school some years ago. I was, I was present with high school teachers from Maine and New Jersey. People traveled hundreds of miles to, to listen to him. He was sitting on the stage all day long trying to answer questions thrown at him by Dean Belville. <laughs> and, and he held his own, and, and he spoke without notes, uh, with, a break, with, a break, with a break for lunch. He, he, he was so infinitely superior to anybody else in the room, including the guy sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, One of his books is, is uh, for, for Cause, cause and, and Comrade. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was based on a little shorter book called Why They Fought. Yeah. He was doing research out at uh, the Huntington Library in California, a lot of soldier records, a lot of memoirs and diaries. And he says that there was a difference in motivation between our troops in World War II. He claims that German troops, British troops, American troops, the GIs in World War II weren't fighting for the flag. They weren't fighting for FDR. They were fighting for each other small unit cohesion, group cohesion, and uh, fighting for each other and, and often dying for each other. And the cohesion, when the casualties become so horrendous that that, that unit begins to dissolve, so does the cohesion. But that in the Civil War, unlike World War II, uh, and, it, and it raises the question of whether the Civil War was the first modern war, or the last traditional war? Or was it something in between? McPherson and others have, have uh, argued about this, that the soldiers in the Civil War were fighting for the Union, or were fighting for slavery, or they're fighting for Southern independence, or they're fighting, as Shelby Foote famously said, because y'all are down here. Uh, <laughs> what are y'all doing down here? Why don't you go home? Uh, so the, the motivations vary, but you know, ultimately something like three million men and several hundred women served in uniform on both sides. And over 620,000, that's one estimate, died. In fact, if you compare the death rate in the Civil War with the population and our population today, the losses, the proportionate losses would be something like six million people. Can you imagine people voting in an election for a, for a candidate or a party or a <coughs> cause they knew would cause six million deaths? Can you imagine them re-electing someone, north or south, that was presiding over that slaughter? You know, Michael, there is one other factor, too, that has not been mentioned. <coughs> and I think people would argue about this. <coughs> there was a, a, a just a fantastic amount of arrogance among the Southern aristocracy. They were sure that they, you know, one senator's worth at least 10 uh, mud seals. They called the, uh, Ameri the uh, Northerners mud seals, which was a term of opprobrium for people who had the lowest kinds of jobs in society. Uh, and uh, I don't personally think there's such a thing as a low kind of job. Uh, my view is work is work and deserves respect, but that's what they said and thought. <coughs> and, and this arrogance, uh, I think, uh, had something to do with their uh, eagerness uh, for battle, at least among the upper class. The, the Mutzel theory of society was the idea that no matter how poor you were, how ignorant, how illiterate, uh, how backward, some hillbilly, a lint head in a, in a textile mill. If you were white, you were above the mud sill. Mm -hmm. If you were an educated black, a free black, uh, one of the aristocrats living in Charleston, uh, there are black slaveholders in every slave state. No matter how intelligent, how much money you had, you're below that mud sill. It's a strict racial dividing line. Dan? Dan, Dan. One thing that hasn't been brought up, and it's affecting uh, what was going on before this, this conflict started and, and 
during the conflict. It was beginning uh, of the era to transmit information, news, the news media. What, what was the, what was going on with the news media just before and, and at the start of the Civil War? We have a lot of opinionated news people now that are making up our minds for us. Uh, was the same thing going on at that time? Absolutely. I think it was. There were war correspondents embedded with the troops, mm -hmm. north and south. Mm -hmm. All kinds of conflict between the journalist and the generals. If the journalist is making a general <coughs> good, he's going to get special access and inside stories. And uh, 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 if the if the journalist is making the general look bad and pointing out that he ordered some disastrous charge or uh, was cowardly in order to retreat for no reason, uh, that reporter. <laughs> He may file one story, but he's going to be banned from the lines. He, he may be put under military arrest. But uh, in the campaign in Western Virginia, uh, McClellan's first uh, real actions and Rosecrans and some of the other <laughs> Union generals, there were two Confederates who were captured uh, in one of the early battles. And they're out of harm's way. They're just kind of watching what's going on around them. And here comes a team of horses pulling a telegraph wire that's unrolling on a spool and one rep says to the other we're whipped Bob the Yankees got the telegraph how can we possibly win uh, they they were taking communications into battle with them uh, especially in the north the south is, is slower uh, on that but northern technology northern industry is, is helping enormously at uh, Bull Run Young telegraph clerk, Andrew Carnegie, is just north of the fighting. He's serving as a telegraph clerk. He's relaying reports <coughs> from the front to Washington. Uh, so it's not too long before you have uh, telegraph operators and, and the wires spreading throughout wherever the Union Army goes, all over the occupied South. Uh, you know, news is being communicated very rapidly. And reporters are filing stories, and the Union Surgeon's diary that edited uh, Frank Dyer, he, he resented these reporters. He, he said they often got it wrong, but then he writes, his let, uh, he writes letters home to his wife in Gloucester asking her for, for news about what's going on because <coughs> he's just a regimental surgeon or a brigade surgeon, and, and he feels that she's getting more news and she's getting it faster than he is. He's got the small picture, but he feels that his wife, Mariah, is probably getting the big picture back home. So don't, don't, don't you think that the, uh, the, the young fellow up on a farm in somewhere in Maine or New Hampshire is, is getting the word of what's going on through the news media and is making up his mind that, gee, this is a, is this a cause that I should join up and, and belong to the, the, the cause and over, uh, overcome the, the slavery issue? We all agree, kind of. It's slavery is underneath this this whole thing somewhere, and uh, uh, you can talk about economics and the other things, but slavery is is the basic issue, and and the minds of the people are being made up by the the word that they're getting through the through the media, whatever it is, probably newspapers. A lot of newspapers. Uh, Americans were avid newspaper readers. Americans who were illiterate would stand around in groups while somebody read the newspaper to them. Issues in newspapers were passed from hand to hand until the paper disintegrated. Uh, we, we were news junkies. We're very active and involved in politics. Uh, we follow political news. We follow elections. This war comes along. We're following what's going on in the war as best we can find out. Yeah, Art? I don't know about everybody else here, but I'm a history channel buff, I, especially when it comes to something like the Civil War. I'll watch that. I just learned recently that, in, especially in the uh, second term, Abraham, uh, not the first, the first term, Abraham Lincoln spent a ton of time at the Western Union office listening to reports coming back in to the front. And the other thing, too, is that uh, they, they wanted, uh, the United States wasn't interested in expanding the system so much so that they approached Russia and say, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put cables all along Russia just to be able to reach there because they couldn't get across on, on the, uh, the Atlantic. And the Russians said, um, well, no, but for the same price of this idea, we'll sell you Alaska. And then William Seward bought the whole 
Bar Arthur's right. Lincoln spent a lot of time, not in the White House, but at the Telegraph office. Uh, he, he's, he's hoping for news. He's hoping for good news. And in the first couple of years, the news is seldom good. He also spends a lot of time down at the War Department uh, and at the uh, Naval Yard, the Anacostia Naval Yard, uh, watching experiments with new types of weapons. He was interested in any kind of weapon that could kill men faster and more efficiently <coughs> and, and get this war over with and end the suffering. Uh, think about Harry Truman and the decision he had to make in 1945, mm. widely criticized, but uh, he was a man on the spot. Lincoln is a man on the spot for the North uh, during this horrible war. Doesn't that make it the first modern war? Because you think about communication, the innovation, I'm reading the book Lincoln and his Admirals. I forget who wrote it. Simmons? Craig yeah, Simmons? Yeah, yeah, I know it. I never realized how involved. I mean, he basically ran the Navy after a while, and it's amazing. But anyway, I think it's the first modern war because of the technology of communication, because now war is all about, I mean, how do we even know what's going on in Libya? We, Iraq, Iraq won. We knew immediately when we were dropping bombs on Baghdad. World War II in Vietnam, there was a slight delay, maybe 12 hours till they filmed it and got it out. But now it's, we know it's in 20 minutes. If it were about, and Lincoln being in the <coughs> office, you know, the Western Union, he wanted immediate updates. To me, that makes it a. And while he's waiting for the telegraph to come in, he's telling dirty jokes to the uh, telegraph operator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, did you hear the one about the farmer's daughter? I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, I was telling, I was telling uh, Priscilla at uh, halftime <coughs> that. Uh, I had on my television program once a Chicago Tribune reporter who wrote a book called uh, about Gatling, uh, Mr. Gatling's wonderful invention or something like that. And it really wasn't about the Gatling gun alone, not at all. It, it placed the Gatling gun in the context of the 1900, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, 19th centuries explosion of technology, <coughs> and which is summed up by saying that, as I once read, in 1800, it took longer to go from London to Rome than in Roman times, because the Romans kept the roads up and the roads stank in 1800. <laughs> by 1900, you had the telephone, <coughs> the telegraph, railroads going 90 miles an hour, steamships crossing the Atlantic in five days, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They even, somebody even invented the fax machine around 1861 or two, but it really didn't do anything for over 100 years. And uh, if you want a really fascinating story about technology, and I haven't even mentioned medical technology, which began burgeoning in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, you should get her, uh, Rebecca, what the hell is her name? Well, call my office and they'll tell you, they'll tell you what the name of the book is and uh, you can get a free copy of the, uh, of the mm. television program. It's amazing. Mm. And this war happened right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you got the telegraph, so people like Grant are exercising command over thousands of miles. You got the railroad, so they're moving mm -hmm. troops hundreds and hundreds of miles in a day or two or a few days. You got steamships on blockade. Uh, you've got re uh, the beginnings of repeating rifles. Photography. Photography, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, you know, uh, what was that famous comment, Mike, of, of the dead of Antietam and Oscar and uh, Oliver <coughs> Wendell Holmes Sr. said it's as if they delivered war to our doorstep because the picture was on the front page. So this, this war was fantastic. It was right smack in the middle of, any, of everything. And frankly speaking, although the uh, Union did adopt a lot of it, for I guess what people consider good and sufficient reasons, they, they uh, made some big mistakes. They did not adopt repeating rifles early enough, and they did not adopt the Gatling gun, except for Ben Butler and a few other people. Well, Custer made the same mistake. He didn't take he his did. Gatling guns to Little Big Woman. That's right. And, uh, and, uh, the repeating so rifle was not adopted soon enough because General Ripley in the Ordnance Department of the, of the War Department, he, the Ordnance Bureau, he said, we couldn't give the troops repeating rifles because they would fire too often. They would waste ammunition. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> Bureaucrat. <laughs> you talk about technology uh, making communication so wonderful, but yet um, when I read about Civil War, a lot of the blunders in the battles is because they didn't have good communication from the generals to uh, 
uh, their subordinates that were maybe two towns away. They needed to get them there, and for some reason, uh, there was miscommunication. The, te now, the telegraph didn't go store. everywhere. The telegraph did not go from, <coughs> from headquarters down to brigade, right. brigade or division right. or regiment right. level. I mean, brings us back to though it was closer to the old wars fought in that respect versus the modern wars where you have good communication. Uh, I'm looking for the photograph. Uh, it's got troops in it. Just to the right of the photograph of W. B. Du Bois, who was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, uh, after this war, if you if you look at that top of the smaller photographs, you'll see Union troops in a trench, and two officers standing mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the on the top of the trench. That's called braving the fire of the enemy. In other words, I'm going to show what a man I am. I'm going to show how brave I am. I'm going to show my courage and display my honor by standing up on top of the trench or on top of a rail fence, uh, like one of the Union heroes at Big Bethel in Hampton, Virginia in the spring of 1861. I'm going to rally my troops by standing on the fence, waving my saber, and some rebel, pow, and there he goes. So in, in that <coughs> sense, that's an example of this being the last or one of the last traditional wars. That this, this is a kind of tomfoolery you saw in Crimea, you saw in the Napoleonic Wars, you saw in the Revolution. But, but I don't know that, I hope that none of our men and women in Afghanistan are, are putting themselves at risk in quite so foolhardy a way. Get down, you damn fool. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who was wounded at Antietam, his father's out searching for Captain Holmes, fears he's dead. He's wounded again, I think it's a minor wound at Fredericksburg. But in the fighting around Washington, D.C., General Jubal Early has come down the Valley of Virginia, and he is going to capture Washington, or at least try to create a diversion, try to force Grant to send troops from Petersburg to weaken his lines to save the capital. And who was there in the Union fortification surrounding the city but Abraham Lincoln? And Lincoln gets up on top of one of these trenches for a better view. And Holmes, by now, is a combat veteran. He's been blooded. And he is down in the trench, and he yells up at him, get down, you damn fool. <laughs> <laughs> Only to realize that it's his commander in chief. Who is being a damn fool. <laughs> and, and Lincoln obeyed the order. Lincoln got down. <laughs> yes, Could I just swing back to the media thing? Sure. Uh, uh, did Lincoln squash, of course, habeas corpus and freedom of the press during this during this whole episode? Throughout the North, he uh, he eventually extended the suspension of habeas corpus from Baltimore to all of Maryland, and eventually to all of the Union states. And freedom of the press, likewise. And freedom of the press. If if you like big government, if you like what our folks in Washington are doing today, then you can thank Mr. Lincoln. If you don't like it. Then you could also thank Mr. Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> but Mike, uh, isn't it also true that uh, Honest Abe always blamed the generals for the suspension of habeas corpus, saying things like, "Well, uh, Burnside uh, thinks that uh, we've got it suspended, so what can I do?" That's not true. His generals, <laughs> telegraph or no, he, he couldn't always control them. Uh, so Ben Butler decides that he is going to seize a hotbed of secession, Baltimore, and, and, and captures it, and, and puts cannon on the hills in the city, <coughs> and you've got martial law in, in, in Baltimore for the rest of the war, but he essentially takes Baltimore out of the fight, and his reward is to be sent to Fort Monroe without any communications or horse or anything else, and he's just parked there. Uh, but, but he can't stay out of trouble. He starts receiving fugitive slaves and refusing to return them to their owners. He says they're confiscated. They're contraband of war. I'm not going to return them. You people are in a rebellion. If you want to sign an oath of loyalty, I'll return your slaves to you. But if you're going to fight against the U.S. government and the Constitution, then I'm going to seize any of your property. I can get my hands on it. But Burnside, Larry mentioned, uh, Burnside, after a disaster at Fredericksburg, was removed from command. He had asked to be removed from command before the battle. He said, I'm not competent. I'm not capable of commanding this army. He knew that he had reached or gotten above the Peter Principle. Uh, 
Lincoln needed a commander. He tried other commanders. He said, no, you're it. So after the disaster at Fredericksburg, uh, uh, Burnside is sent to be the military governor, the superintendent uh, out in, is it Indiana or Ohio? I think Ohio, but I'm not sure. The guy that's running for governor there, He, he is a hot secessionist. He, he is a copperhead. Valdingham? Call, Valdingham? Yes, Valandingham. Yes, Valandingham. Clement Valandingham. They called him copperheads, like the poisonous snake. They identified themselves with a piece of copper cut out from a penny that they would wear in the lapel. And, and these people were virulently uh, racist, hated the Union government, hated the Republican Party, hated the Lincoln administration. And Valandingham is, is going to run for governor and try to take his state out of the war. Uh, Burnside stupidly arrests him, makes him a martyr. Uh, and Lincoln says, let him go. They send him into Confederate lines. Confederates don't want him. <laughs> don't trust him. They send him to Canada. So Valandingham wages his campaign for election as governor of Ohio from Canada with Union agents shadowing every move. He's overwhelmingly defeated. One less problem for Mr. Lincoln. Some years after the war, he's defending a man in court accused of murdering another man in a barroom <coughs> brawl. And lawyer Valandingham is demonstrating that his client did not shoot this other man, did not murder him. That in the fight, the other man was going for a gun that was stuck in his waistband, in his trousers, behind his back, and as he was pulling out his revolver, it went off. And as Valandingham is demonstrating this to the jury, the revolver goes off, and he dies the next day. <laughs> but, 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 the jury acquits his client. <laughs> A good lawyer will go to any length. <laughs> Let me ask a related question to first modern war, last traditional war. Was this a total war? That's another question that historians have spilled a lot of ink on. Was this a total war? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. In what way? Well, you take a general like Sherman and his march to the sea. He destroyed everything, totally. Uh, he, he, brought, he brought the war to the people of the South, and he took away their livelihood, their crops, uh, industry, whatever they had, he took away. Destroyed railroads. I mean, he he, he went through like the, you know, the, the blight that the uh, locusts caused in this country, you know, in the early 1920s or so. I mean, it, it, he just destroyed the, the South, and that, that, that is total war. But when you go after the general population and take away their, their uh, sustenance, you're, you're a total war. You're a total war. And, uh, you know, I, I can only think from my experience in Vietnam. I mean, in, when, you, when you go to war, and I'm just flashing back to what, what you asked about uh, why why these people went to fight. Uh, I can only speak from my my experience and my my family's experience in the Second World War and the Korean War. I chose to go, I joined because I felt it was a, my duty. And it's true, you know, when you when you go to war you don't think about dying. That that's the last thing that you think about until you're there and you see it. Then the war is real. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an awful thing to see. You know, anybody that has been to war knows what I'm saying. And uh, the war was the first modern war because of the, of the, the weapons that were used. And it was the last traditional war because of the tactics that we use. Let's not forget that the, they went from a, a regular smooth bore uh, musket to a rifle musket mini ball, which was accurate. 
know, the musket, you had to go up to within, say, 50 yards of a person to, to you know, actually bring them down. And uh, with a rifled musket, you, you know, you were good for 100, 200 yards. You know, so, I mean, it was vast improvements happened during the Civil War. Thank you for your comment. Your name? George. George. Thank you, George. Uh, George is, is absolutely right about Sherman. <coughs> if you look at James Reston's book, New York Times columnist, uh, Sherman in Vietnam, or Sherman's March, uh, uh, he, he, has a, he spends an entire book, it was serialized in the New Yorker, but he spends an entire volume comparing Vietnam with the American Civil War, and specifically Sherman's March across Georgia from Atlanta to the city. Much more recently, there's a wonderful novel by E.L. Doctorow. He wrote uh, Ragtime, he did a number of other novels, and he's got a book that's simply called uh, The March. And it's told from the viewpoint of all kinds of characters, black and white, northern and southern, absolutely fascinating. I didn't find a single mistake there. Uh, the dialogue is invented, but everything that he says, everything that he describes, either did take place or could have taken place. Sherman is practicing chemical warfare. His troops are burying containers in the ground that will poison the soil for generations to come. And Alan Garganis, an oldest living Confederate widow, tells all he has the character, the narrator of this huge novel, flying over Georgia, looking down at the three lines of march that Sherman's troops took across the state and saying that the foliage was a different color. That you can see three bands of different colored vegetation where Sherman was. But you know, Mike, the, the one difference that people do point to, <coughs> and I hadn't known about this, and this of course barely tell what I'm about to say. Um, Sherman, unlike the Nazis, unlike the Russians, Heaven help us, unlike the Brits and the Americans because of carpet bombing in World War II, Sherman didn't uh, kill the po population willy-nilly. And if you define, uh, it, you can define total war either of two ways, I guess. And if you use the uh, definition that says you gotta go after the population and try to kill them, then it was uh, halfway a total war. You know, I'd also point out, too, that if, we, to if we define a total war as destruction of... You know, Sherman didn't like, try to kill the population. Right. If, if we define he, a total war... He took sustenance, right, if, which if, is the same thing. But, I mean, it's, it's not declaring war on the, on the individual. Well, right, you know, if, let me ask you this, George. Is it the same thing? Because Sherman uh, cut three swaths... <coughs> as I heard the position say on the radio today, three swathes through, uh, through uh, Georgia. <coughs> but that left the most of Georgia unscathed. Well, he, he, he destroyed all his uh, supply lines in back of him. Right. His troops had to live off the land. Right. Forage liberally. That's right. And uh, they did. That, that again is bringing war to the population. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What is your definition of total war? Well, there are some people, Mark, what's his name? Freely? I think so. <coughs> who, th who think that total war means that uh, you go try to kill the population as well as destroy the country. The Germans and Russians. Well, what I'd like to point out too is that, you know, if we're going to define a total war as destruction of the enemy's property, uh, then just about every war that's ever been fought has been a total war because what did, the, what did the Spartans do in the Peloponnesian War when they invaded Athens? They burned all their crops, right? So, uh, you know, you can't use, you know, economics alone as a definite total <coughs> war, but I agree with Dean Belville. I think, I think uh, you know, yeah, obviously in a total war you're going to destroy the enemy's crops, but unlike World War II, you know, when the second half of World War II, the bombing campaign changed to, you know, st from strategic bombing to killing large amounts of the population, they became legitimate military targets in, in terms of targeting. So I, I, I think if you're going to define a total war, it's not only a, co it's a combination of, yes, you're going to destroy their property and it means to make <coughs> war, but you're also going to kill large amounts but, of the But population. you know, the other side of it, from George's <coughs> standpoint, would be that while this is true today, mm -hmm. what Sherman did had not been the practice since, I think, the Treaty of Westphalia, where because it's 1600 or something, mm -hmm. 59, 60, because there had been such destruction in Germany 
that they decided they have to outlaw going after civilians and their property. And so, you know, there's a wonder there's a wonderful scene in Gettysburg, the movie, which I've only seen 35 or 40 times. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I, uh, I do exercises, and there's this wonderful scene where Lee says uh, to uh, who was it? Who was his uh, uh, aide? Um, uh, anyhow, he says, uh, 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 "Captain, the men, you will make sure that the men behave properly." Because he had asked him, "Are the men, uh, you know, taking things from the people?" And he said, "Oh, they're behaving uh, very well, Your Honor. Although, I mean, uh, General, uh, although I must admit it would be easier." If the Yankees had not, uh, you know, ravaged Virginia when they were down there, mm -hmm. and Lee looks at him and says, you know, with this dignified thing, and he's, he's uh, rebuking him. He says, "You will ensure that the men at all times behave properly, and you will notify me of any failures to do so." And so that, and that is thing. that is such claptrap. Yeah. Uh, General Lee mm -hmm. says mm -hmm. one thing. That's true. His troops do exactly the reverse. There's yeah. a Kentucky lawyer who's written a huge book about retreat from Gettysburg, and certainly it was a military disaster for the South and for Lee's army. But in terms of the provisions, <coughs> the fodder, the horses, the sheep, the goats, the chickens, well, the chickens probably didn't make it. They were eaten <laughs> immediately, but <laughs> they took enough animals and enough forage and enough crops and, and other possessions from Pennsylvania, from Gettysburg all the way back south across Maryland to keep Lee's army, this historian says, going for another year. They extended the, the, the life of the Army of, the, of Northern Virginia for at least a year based on what they grabbed in Pennsylvania because they, they had nothing to eat in Virginia. It had been thoroughly cleaned out and fought over. And, and, and this, this Gettysburg campaign is in part, and becomes totally after his defeat, a, a resupply <coughs> and a reprovisioning campaign. And he said so when he was trying to make his, when he was trying to downplay the fact that they lost. He said, well, my reasons for going in were blah, 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 and one of them was complete resupply. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Who, who's the guy from Kentucky? He is such an avid Confederate. I'm telling you, <laughs> he would secede today, and yet he's saying this. <laughs> <laughs> I know the guy. I met him. You know, Eleanor Jim can think of the name. I, I'm blocking it. It's not a B. I'm it's blocking it. Really but, 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 but trust me, th this guy is uh, somewhere to the right of Jefferson Davis when it comes to the Confederacy. <laughs> Who was the greatest general in the war? Uh, you got two candidates on the wall yeah. over there. That's the one. Who well, won? The guy who won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Arthur. I saw something the other day that I really didn't even know it existed. That General Lee made one of the most grievous mistakes of any military commander ever in taking charge. He, uh, he was uh, he told Longstreet, who was standing next to him, and Longstreet said, "Why don't we just go around and attack Washington? Why?" Because we can't take this. Uh, from where the Confederates were to Little Round Top was a mile long stretch of field. And we said, no, the enemy's there, that's where we're going to fight them. He lost, out of 12,000 men that started that charge, 5,000 never came back. And uh, I don't know, it just seems to me that uh, that's a ridiculous, you know, when you talk about modern war, you don't see that. In, but that just seems to So, Arthur, why did he order the assault? He was there. He, he wanted to defeat the. Uh, yeah, he, he <coughs> said. Uh, pre, he said be, before that that um, he was going to take those hills, and he said if uh, Stonewall Jackson were here, we'd have had him already. But uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean. That's Douglas Southall Freeman's verdict on the Battle of Gettysburg in his four-volume biography. Lee. The chapter in Gettysburg ends with one sentence, and says, "Jackson is not here." Whether Jackson would have would have saved the day or made a difference, we don't know. But uh, Lee is going to go right at him. Uh, he's the son of a gambler and a high stakes uh, uh, politician. Uh, family loses most of its fortune. Uh, he, he's his demeanor is is quite different from what he is inside. He is an extremely aggressive individual. 
And, and I also point out that he wasn't the only general that made a mistake of sending troops in a battle like that. I'm thinking of you know Burnside at Fredericksburg, that mm -hmm. was futile attacking Murray's Heights. And of course, if you fast forward from Gettysburg 11 months to the day, June 3rd, you've got General Grant at Cold Harbor sends his troops in a battle. And, you know, he suffers almost the same number of casualties as uh, Gettysburg. All the difference is he sends 50,000 men into action versus Lee's 12. But it's remarkable because most people celebrate Pickett's Charge as, you know, um, a display of great manhood, and then they condemn Grant. And, you know, you, you know, statistically speaking, more, more Southerners, you know, fell at, at, uh, at uh, Pickett's Charge than they did uh, yep. in comparison to the number one in it than they did at Cold Harbor. Grant has, in, uh, Lee has, in fact, repeated the mistake he made at Mowry Hill against McClellan, of all people. Yep. Although McClellan had artillery, and he also had the Navy and the James River protecting his, his left flank. Mm -hmm. uh, but Lee orders an assault at Mowry Hill that is a bloodbath. And almost exactly a year later, you, you have Pickett's Charge. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you ever watch movies of World War I, mm -hmm. 50 years later, machine guns, artillery of remarkable power, and they did the same damn thing. Yeah, 1916, the song. You see him going over the trenches in line. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, they, will they ever learn kind of like that? <laughs> Easy in hindsight to say, yeah, he screwed up, That's because right. we know what happened. Right. But at the time, he didn't have all the information that we know now. And, and he, not only that, I'm not he, just, oh, sorry. he thought the center point was the weakest part of the Union line. Why did he think of you? Because in, I guess, I'm guessing, in past battles, they had strengthened the flank more than anywhere else. And why would they have strengthened the flanks by July 3rd at Gettysburg? Because he hit the flanks on both, uh, both flanks the day before. He tried to tear up both flanks yeah. of Meade's army. And he assumed, That's right. he reasoned, that they must have weakened the center. Yeah. yeah. He also planned a, a rear assault, which mm -hmm. never made it. Which never made it. Um, he also didn't know... The, uh, the amount of uh, troops they had behind that front line at the angle and along the stone wall. Um, so, you know, it's easy to say that now, but and, and also in, in what he had to work with. In Lee's defense, let's remember that this, this, is, this is the Army of Northern Virginia who had pummeled the Union Army time and again all the way up to Gettysburg, and he also knew he was attacking an army being led by George Gordon Meade, who had only taken command of the Army five days before. Well, so, I mean, you have a, a very confident commander with veteran troops who had proved time and again that they could kick the Yankees' butt going into Gettysburg. So, you're absolutely right. It's very easy to look back in hindsight and say, oh, you should have done this rather than that. But, you know, putting yourself in these shoes at the time, I'm not so sure I would have made any decisions any different than he did, you know, based on what he had to work with and what he knew. He's, he's an overly confident commander. He believes in his men. He, th he thinks they can attack hell itself. Mm -hmm. um, and after it's over, he goes out on the field to welcome the survivors back and he tells them that it's all my fault. And he was a risk taker too. And, and you know, look at Chancellorsville. He took a great risk dividing his army to pay it off. So this is a guy that knew that if you take calculated risks, Jim, why is he off. taking those risks? Well, he had to. I mean, why? well, because he was fighting a vastly superior army, and you know, he had to take great risks in order to try to even the odds. Are you saying that the South couldn't win a war of attrition? No, I don't think the South could have won, won a war of attrition. Could we win such a war against China? No, probably not. Not no. a chance. No. Probably not. Well, you know, the answer to that might be that the ratio of casualties is stupendous uh, when you consider the attack attacker versus the defense mm -hmm. as, as early as the Civil War because of the mini, mini ball rifle. Mm -hmm. But Lee was a, a guy who uh, was like the Paul Bear Bryant of his day, you know, he's going to just boom. And he refused to uh, accept that the South could fight, I, I won't call it a war of attrition because I agree with what people said about a war of attrition, that the South could fight on the defensive, simply gunning down the Union soldiers as they did at Fredericksburg and as they did at mm -hmm. Cold Harbor, mm -hmm. and make the war so painful for the Union that it would quit by if he fought in that way, and instead he would send his men because he was this aggressive guy. He he like had the greatest uh, the greatest uh, ground uh, ground game uh, until uh, this guy Texas Christian invented the uh, that formation. Um, he would lose ten thousand, fifteen thousand men in a battle. This is just crazy when you're this out. You can't afford this. Men that he could not replace. That well, yes, that's the point. 
And he hoped, I guess, well, I know, I, I think from what I read it, it's always such, he hoped that what he would be able to do is destroy the Union Army and knock the Union out of the war that way. He did not understand, according to some experts, that in the modern war, by the Civil War, due to the mini, uh, mini ball rifle, the, the, and it was the four tanks and airplanes opened up war again in, in the World War II, the defense had all the advantages, and the attackers are going to be butchered. So he, he, I mean, the, the knockout, the reason some people like Alan, what's his name, say that Grant was twice the general is that, of course, Grant had the men, he was a bulldog, he was supposed to be a, a much better tactician uh, than, uh, than uh, Lee's uh, lost cause people ever, ever given Grant credit for. They say his uh, Vicksburg campaign was one of the most brilliant in American history. Uh, Grant knew, uh, couldn't stand the sight of blood, by the way, he wouldn't eat raw, uh, uncooked meat. Um, had to be charred. Charred, yeah. Grant knew that he was going to lose men, but he figured this is what he's got to do, and he can, I guess he figured he can afford the losses because they can be replaced. Lee seemed to have no, no grasp. He was just destroying the South's manpower. Does the North get to a point where maybe it can't afford those losses? Can you think of a time, do you know of a time during the war when it becomes a very close Right. Sure. Uh, for the Union side, you, you, this is, you know, 1864, and in the Virginia campaign, he's got to cannibalize his heavy artillery units to make up his losses from like the wilderness and Spotsylvania and, and so on. He sends the heavies out, yeah. and, and they have no combat. They have no combat. I mean, the field. Great ground soldiers. They They're had the best bombs on the battlefield. <coughs> and when, they were, when they were all shot to pieces at, at uh, Cold Harbor, they can identify them because they had the best uniforms in the army. During the spring <coughs> and summer of 64, what is Lincoln doing? The election. Right. What does he think about his re-election chances? Not at all. I don't think he's going to no chance. Slim. What record do we have there? This is a primary source document. Lincoln writes a memorandum to himself and signs it and puts it in his desk drawer. He doesn't tell anybody about it. But he says, given the Democratic platform, given the platform that their candidates are running on, if the Democrats win the election and I leave office in March, I'll have to make the best deal I can, either try to win the war very quickly in, in the few months remaining, or try to work something out because my successor will immediately arrange peace with the Confederates. But Lincoln underestimates the Democrats. <laughs> because they, they, time and again, you can rely on Democrats to pull defeat out of the jaws of victory. <laughs> <laughs> they, they nominate who for president? McClellan. <coughs> George McClellan. But he was very popular still. He was very popular. And the day after the Democrats nominated him, <coughs> Sherman captures Atlanta. Poof. Uh, and just before Christmas, he's captured Savannah, which he presents to Lincoln in a telegram, modern communications, with so many pieces of artillery, hundreds of ar pieces of artillery, and thousands of bales of cotton. Cotton speculators are committing suicide. The cotton that they've been hoarding in New York and London has reached a staggering level in terms of price. And Sherman captures an enormous amount of cotton, and the price plunges. My, Michael, it is my understanding that nobody has the least notion <coughs> what Lincoln meant when he said in that memo, it will be my duty to do whatever it is to get this war over because uh, my successor will have been elected on a platform that will make it impossible for him to pursue it. And of course, one possibility, I guess, but nobody seems to know, is that he would have told Grant, that's it, attack. Yeah, it's impossible to read the man's mind. He, he is so often opaque. Uh, you can't, uh, can't figure him out. His law partner, Billy Herndon, said of Mr. Lincoln, he always called him Mr. Lincoln in Springfield. He said, when Mr. Lincoln wants to be, he is the most shut-mouthed man I ever knew. 
<laughs> and if he shuts up, if he clams up, you cannot get him to tell you what he's going to do or what he's thinking or, or what he's planning. Uh, played his cards close to the vest, kept his own peace. It's funny, Michael. I was just last, I've been reading Supreme Power, which is a book about the attempt to pack the court in 1937. Roosevelt was the same way. The guy was a non-stop talker who would tell you nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he kept it all to himself. <laughs> Let me ask you about the role of women in this war. How important are women to the war efforts north and south? Mark? There was a woman who I believe worked, and I don't mean the Clara Martin, I, she did something with the, the northern troops, and Ulysses at Grant said, she outranks me. I, I don't That's Mother Bickerdike, and it was Sherman who said she outranks me. And in fact, it's Mother Bickerdike who leads Sherman's army in the Grand Review in Washington in May of 1865. Mm -hmm. She was the real deal. Yeah. Think about Clara Barton, tireless self-promoter. Mm -hmm. uh, Barton was hardly the only woman who was hit by a, a small arms fire during the war. And uh, there are many women north and south who are on the battlefield, who are working in hospitals, but uh, far more than just, you know, hospital nurses, 20,000 women in the North, it's estimated, over 20,000 are doing all kinds of war-related jobs for the Army and, and probably 10,000 in the South. Something also I didn't know is that the first psychiatric hospital was opened, I believe, just after the war, St. Saint, Saint Catharines in Washington, D.C. <coughs> mm, I think you might be in St. Elizabeth. St. Elizabeth. That's where Hinckley is. Yeah. That's where they kept Ezra Pound after World War II. Didn't kill anybody, but he was anti-Semitic, and he, he wrote Nazi propaganda. So after the war, they put him in a cage, light on 24-7, and that's where they kept him. Sort of like the character in uh, Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal Lecter. There's, there's one other question I'd like to ask. I'll throw this out there. I belonged to a Civil War group about 20 years ago, and I was told very possibly the first casualty of the war was buried right in St. Bellevue Cemetery in Lawrence. His name was Sumner Needham. Is that... Killed in Baltimore? He was that's one that's of the, dread, right? in, in, the six, in the sixth mass. He was one of the ones that was killed. Yeah. yeah. I, I've heard he's the first casualty <coughs> of the Civil War. I don't know one of the about early that. Ones. He was certainly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he wasn't even. the only one killed. I just day, read so. somebody that uh, somebody in uh, Fort Sumter was the yes. first casualty. I think it was the next day when they were firing the hunger gun salute. It, it they were firing the salute from Ken and Burst. Yeah. That was Private Daniel Huff. Was a friend H -O -U -G -H. Of, uh, it was a friend of Lincoln's, or somebody <coughs> who was very close to him. Uh, that, that was, what, what was his name again? Uh, Ellsworth. Ellsworth. Yeah, I'm not sure that this guy was, but you never know. Everyone's a <laughs> best friend of Lincoln sometimes. <laughs> 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 yeah. He had a lot of them. Yeah. What, what about the role played by black troops? How significant is that? Very significant. Why, George? Yes. Because uh, the, the battles going on at the time, the Union was losing more troops than assault in, in, in battle. The, the Southern troops were, I won't, I won't say better fighters, but like you stipulated, they did a lot on defense. And they, they killed a lot of Union troops. So the, the number of Union troops was going down. And they figured now is the time to, you know, the, the abolitionists uh, up here in Mass, well, down in Massachusetts, decided, you know, it would be a good time to introduce the black troops into the war. It would give the Union a needed advantage. And it did. It really did. I mean, a, a, a lot of historians uh, back, I mean, I have two, a two-set volume of the uh, history <coughs> of the rebellion that was written in 1867. And it kind of like skims over that. But the black troops were, were very, very important. And it's, it's one thing that, uh, you know, a lot of people don't really know about. You know, their, their contribution. And it was, it, was, it was very significant. Even though they were trying to be given less money, uh, trying to be, you know, put as uh, portrayed as contraband. Situation for them, but they proved that they could. Uh, they proved to the 
so-called uh, leadership in the armies, that they, they were willing and able to fight. And that, that was a very important uh, thing for the Northern Army. There's some books on the reading list that, that detail <coughs> that story, uh, that subject. Um, a couple of places put on your bucket list. We were talking about Gettysburg. If you haven't been to Gettysburg, I, I would urge you to go. Uh, and spend as much time as you can there. It, it is literally holy ground. Mm. And another place, much more recent to go to, and it was built, uh, you know, it, it took a lot of people, a lot of agitating, a lot of lobbying to get it built, but there is a relatively new African-American soldier and sailors memorial in D.C., right on a metro stop, I think it's P Street or Q Street, but uh, you, you come up the escalator out of the metro stop and it's right in front of you as you come outside. It is just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the great... I, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, you, I didn't know. Well, I, you know, I, obviously, when you start talking about the, the, uh, the uh, black uh, soldiers <coughs> in the Civil War, I, I love the 54th. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I, but I think, to me, it seems like the whole idea for, especially for, for Northerners, was besides, besides all the other business about how they were going to respond in, in, uh, in war, in battle, I mean, which was to me is always silly because they fought in the American <coughs> Revolution. There were blacks in the American Absolutely. Revolution. There were blacks in every war that this country mm -hmm. had ever had, even up to that point. But uh, I think what it did, what I would think, is that people who were sitting there who were going to, who had been first soldiers that had gone to Sumter and people, and they were trying to get people to come into the military. I think it only made sense, and, and it, it gave people a better feeling about it, to, to actually see black troops defending their own and fighting for their own freedom as well. I, I think that had to be a big, uh, a, a big uh, uh, aid to the uh, to the uh, Republican to the Republican administration. And, uh, and they obviously performed very well, even though they took some very serious casualties, uh, casualties in, in some, but they uh, apparently performed very well. And it kind of changed, of course it changed the whole idea of, of uh, those people who still somehow felt that uh, African Americans could not, uh, could not perform uh, in battle. It certainly changed that, uh, that thinking. <coughs> I think it's important that they were out there fighting for their own freedom. I think that did a lot for people. But they were dying for, dying for this cause as well. Could Mary? It, yeah, I think today at Remembrance Day at Gettysburg, they do um, on the Friday before the parade on the actual, you know, which might not be the date of um, the Gettysburg uh, service there. They do now invite people to go and um, <coughs> you know pay homage to the African American. A community soldier that died there, and I don't remember that doing that like three years ago, four years ago. Uh, I could be wrong, but has anybody else gone to that ceremony? I haven't. I know in the grand review of the Union armies in May in Washington in '65, the black troops were not invited. But they do invite the public to come over and pay homage. Black soldiers were the honor guard <coughs> transporting Lincoln's uh, coffin from the U.S. Capitol to the train station to take him home, but they weren't invited to march in the grand review. Right, right. Helen, you had a comment? Well, I just really want to recommend a book uh, called Diary of a Contraband, and it's about an African-American sailor. And for some reason, he, had, he knew how to write. And uh, his, uh, because they didn't, it was against the law to teach them. And, uh, but he uh, kept a diary, and his, well, he was William B. Gould I, and William B. Gould IV, uh, they found his diary. Uh, it was almost thrown out. And it's, it's a twofer because you get, um, well, it's a threefer because you get the story of the whole Gould family, but you also get the life of a sailor in the 19th century. And also, this is a, a man who escaped as a slave and then um, served as, as mostly a, as a blockade runner, but then also in, they were disappointed that they couldn't get the Alabama because the Kearsarge had already gotten it. But then <coughs> thirdly, he, he, he came back to Nantucket married a, a, a freed African-American woman there, mm -hmm. moved to Dedham, was involved with all of these things. So it's his whole life. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so it's uh, it's actually on the internet too. The William Gould IV insisted that it be put on the internet, but it's uh, available in paperback. 
and it's remarkable just because it all that you get out of it. George, you had a comment? Yeah, uh, let's not forget that the salt introduced black troops into the water. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but they were mostly digging the trenches. And you know, the Navy, which is a hot hat, which for 150 years was a hotbed of racism and anti Semitism, uh, had more black sailors as a percentage and so forth than were in the, uh, and earlier on. If you take a, 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 a look at the picture, the famous picture of the men out of the monitor, you will see quite a few African American faces. And the monitor, remember, was sunk by 1862, late 1862. So the Navy was a little bit different than the Army. And if I'm not mistaken, so Still like, I think, I think um, <laughs> no, 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 but, but, but it's much better. If I'm not mistaken, I think also too, black sailors always got equal pay with white sailors, if I'm not mistaken, in the U.S. Navy, which so. is not true about the Union Army. They, they no, have been in the Navy the before the, the war. Right. But uh, it also too, I mean, I think it, plus you, you know, it makes sense to do that because it takes a lot more to train a sailor than it does to train an infantry. Right. One but last sort of question for you. What's, what's the legacy of the war? What what should we tell our children, our grandchildren, our students, our friends and neighbors? You know, why why is this war important? Or is it <coughs> so important? Does it matter? Why why are you here today? <laughs> <laughs> it's American history. This is unique. The Civil War is very unique. If right, if right at the rounds of the Constitution. Uh, not all, all men are created equal. It wasn't true. And it, it wasn't true to 1960 and even today. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. we're seeing this, you know, you're seeing it with how you treat gay people, how you treat Latin America, you know, Latin coming into the country. It's, we're a much better country than we were, and that defined us as a country that we had to do what was right tomorrow. I, I agree with that. I, I think really um, a lot of the things that, in fact, we, uh, as we, as, as we're indicating, I, the, the, the slavery issue wasn't one that was that was that started in after after they stopped importing slaves in 1820. It was always there, and it was, but it was one that they couldn't address because you wanted the South on board, of course, and you were talking about taking their property, and uh, so it was one that they couldn't really deal with. But we knew that morally and even 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 on national consciousness. That was wrong. Mm -hmm. It was against mm -hmm. what we were supposed to represent, what the mm -hmm. Revolutionary War was supposed to represent. And so I think that I think something was gonna gonna have to happen eventually. And this was this was really the great kind of confl conflagration that really started to set us on the course that we should have been things that could that weren't done uh, when the uh, when the nation was founded. And of course, it still took time. It wasn't. Uh, didn't resolve all all issues, but at least it set us on the right course as a nation. I think that's my humble opinion. Yeah, I agree. The whole legal system was at stake. <laughs> yeah. Would have failed. Well, that that's an important point because, Mike, why don't you address the fact that it is widely thought that had the Union permitted secession to occur or not win the Civil War. Uh, it was only a matter of time until North America would have been nothing but a bunch of little Balkans. And that's what the European elite was hoping. Mm -hmm. This great commercial and economic power that was driving the British merchant marine below water and split apart. Mm -hmm. They predicted in 1776 and 1787 that such a republic could never endure. In 1861, this was still an experiment. True. It's an experiment today. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that what globalism is? <coughs> they still don't want the United States to be the power of the East. Mm -hmm. We're a threat. And actually, apropos of the Balkanization, the French with Maximilian went into Mexico about what, 1864? And we sent all of the black troops in the Union Army to guard the Mexican border and also occupy Texas during Reconstruction. Yeah. Tough job, both of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second especially. Well, I want to close and just urge you to observe the next four years, to urge your neighbors, your friends, your acquaintances, your family members, uh, 
the next four years, we are, we are commemorating uh, something very, very important. And uh, think about the strength it took and the strength that was sacrificed. Uh, think about Mr. Lincoln. In 1865, he went down to the trenches at Petersburg to visit General Grant and talk strategy and tell him what to do. And he was still able to demonstrate to the enlisted men a trick that he was doing in Illinois growing up. He could hold full-size axe by the butt end, just grabbing it with his fingers like this. And unlike me, because I don't pump iron, he could <laughs> hold it out at arm's length for quite a while without trembling. Incredible individual. Uh, it wasn't the axe, but it was that strength that I think helped ultimately decide this contest. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Well done. You answered, you answered all the questions and more.